There have been numerous supposed successors to the McLaren F1. There was the Bugatti Veyron that surpassed it in terms of top speed. There was the McLaren P1, which became the next top tier McLaren supercar. And then more recently, we've had the Speedtail with its three-seater layout and its focus on outright speed. Today, we are at Dunsfold Aerodrome, the top gear test track, to take an exclusive deep dive into arguably the proper successor to the McLaren F1. A car designed by the man that originally took us past 240 miles an hour. And it's this, the Gordon Murray T50 fan car. So this is it, and it does look a lot like a McLaren F1, and that's no bad thing, but there is a big difference around the back. That thing there is a 40 centimeter aerodynamic fan. So just like Gordon Murray's Brabham BT46 F1 car, this car uses a ground effect fan to suck the car down into the tarmac and creates downforce on a level that we've never seen before on a road car. There's more to this car's aero package than just the fan, however. There's so many ducts for cooling and airflow all over the car. And then there's also these two separate wings on the rear that are active aero. So they will come up and down depending on how you are driving the car. This car has six different aero modes on it, which will reconfigure all the aero on the car. The modes are as follows. First up, auto mode. This is the car in its standard form with the rear spoilers, fan and underbody ducts optimising individually to the speed of the car and driver input. Then there's braking mode which deploys the rear spoilers and increases the speed of the fan. This doubles downforce to enhance stability and grip and greatly reduces the car's braking distances. Now things are getting interesting with high downforce mode. This is all about traction, with the fan and spoilers working together to increase downforce by up to 30%. Then to go down the other route, the T50 has a streamline mode, which reduces the car's drag by 10% to increase straight line speed. This mode closes the underbody ducts and sets the fan at high speed to elongate the trailing wake of the car, essentially simulating a long tail design. To hit the T50's true top speed, we have a VMAX mode, which is the same as Streamline mode, but increases power by 30 horsepower by using the energy from the 48 volt integrated starter motor, a power bump that can be used for up to three minutes. And finally, we have Test mode, which is used when the car is at a standstill to demonstrate all the aero trinkets on the car at once as well as being able to check that everything is functioning as it should. The fan also has inlets on top of the car to aid cooling, meaning that the device manipulates the airflow both on top of and below the car simultaneously, maximizing downforce as well as efficiency. And yes, that's a six-speed manual transmission. I imagine the thought of the weight of a dual-clutch gearbox makes Professor Gordon Murray violently ill. So it's got its aero sorted, but being a Gordon Murray car, it of course has one hell of an engine. Now I've actually covered the development of the stunning motor that's gonna be powering this car, the link to which is over there somewhere. But we actually have one of the engines here. Let's take a look back over the specs of this amazing piece of kit. 3.9 litres of naturally aspirated V12, 650 horsepower, and that's actually added to by an integrated 48 volt starter motor down there, and also ram air induction on the roof scoop, which takes it up to about 700 horsepower. The headline figure on the car though, a rev limit of 12,100 RPM. That's by far a new record for a road car and actually takes over from one of Gordon Murray's past projects, the light car company Rocket. And there's more. This thing is by far and away the most responsive engine 
ever seen in a road car. This thing picks up at 28,400 revs per second. So to give you a gauge, the McLaren F1's engine, which was famed for being incredibly responsive, only picks up at 10,000 revs per second. So this thing gets from idle to its max revs, 12,100, in just 0.3 seconds. I can barely fathom how they managed to get this engine to rev that quickly in a road car. This thing is absolutely phenomenal. Sadly, this car is engineless, but there's a good reason for that. The engine is currently at Cosworth on the dyno. Now, at time of filming, we've heard it at 8,000 RPM. Here's a clip of what that sounds like. So if that is what it sounds like at 8,000 RPM, what is it going to sound like at 12,000 RPM with another additional 4,000 plus RPM added on? The engine in this thing is going to be truly face melting. I had so many questions about this car, so it was time to bring in the absolute legend of a man that is Professor Gordon Murray. Gordon, thank you so much for having us. With this car, it seems like you've developed it and revealed it in relatively no time at all compared to other hypercars that are being developed right now. Has it been a quick process or how has the development process for this car been? Yeah, I think, I think we work in a very efficient way. We're a relatively small business. We're only 150 people and uh, we don't have layers of management or committees. Uh, and we started talking about this as a concept in September 2017, 2018, I beg your pardon, and then started detailed design at the beginning of last year. So we're just about 18 months in to this point, which is quite normal for us. We have done prototypes in under a year before for other customers, um, but that's about right. And we're about 18 months from production, so it's a three-year program, which is pretty typical for us. Okay. It's, it's hard to know where to start, but I think we'll have to go with the fan. Was the fan always something you wanted to integrate after the Brabham, or was that a sort of eureka moment during the development of the car? No, it was neither, actually. Um, the, the Brabham fan car was a very crude device, you know. It, it was a bit of a, I won't say cheat, but it was bending the rules to beat Lotus with their ground effect because yeah. we couldn't with our engine geometry. Um, but that was a crude device. I mean, that was a huge engine-driven fan and skirts around the car, and it, it was a vacuum cleaner. It sucked itself to the road, basically. This is much more sophisticated. This is what we call boundary layer control. And I actually had this on the F1 with two small fans, yeah. uh, but only operating over two tiny sections, about 150 mil wide, of the diffuser. So normally diffusers are very gentle, but I had two sections that were much steeper, which the air generally won't follow. Uh, but by removing the boundary layer and the vortices in those areas, you force the air to stick to that shape. And we got about 5% more downforce with the fans on on the F1. So the, the McLaren F1 is actually a fan car, it is. but it's not really themed for it being is. that. It is, exactly. No, I think, I think its problem was it had too many firsts. You know, it was the first carbon car. It was the first car of that weight, central driving position, the first car with active aero and all, you know, active brake cooling. It had all these things and, and the fan got overlooked. Um, right. So this, I just, I just logged that when I did the F1 and I thought if ever I get a chance to do another supercar, um, I'd love that fan to be expanded to the full size of the diffuser under the car, just to increase efficiency, but more importantly, to give the driver more control over the downforce. So this car doesn't need skirts like the Brabham? Not at all, no, no. It's that, that was, as I say, very crude. I mean, th this just enhances. This is a regular ground effect car with just ridiculously steep diffusers, and the fan helps those work. Okay. And what does the CFD model of this car look like? It must be crazy what's yes, happening. So we did, we did, I think just on the fan alone, we did over 400 runs. Wow. And some of them take, the bigger ones have taken 24 hours sometimes, you know, because it's such a heavy model. Um, but it's been fun, you know. I, it, it, the really good thing is the results. We set targets for the fan on, on drag reduction and on increase in downforce. And uh, just for example, we wanted at least 50% increase in downforce under braking. We've got 100% increase in, in downforce wow. instantaneously. 
and uh, we, we set an 8% re drag reduction in streamline mode and we've actually got 12.5% drag reduction. So. I would love to see the CFD model. I don't know if you'll ever reveal that, but seeing the Oh yes, we, we'll, we'll be writing the book. So. Right. Okay, fair enough. So with this car, I think people are starting to create a new hypercar category right now. We've got the Merc AMG1, we've got the Aston Valkyrie, and I see this as potentially the other part of a new sort of holy trinity. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that comparison and what are your opinions on the Merc and the Aston? I, I think I think saying there's a holy trinity is absolutely right because those are the three current sort of supercars, if you like, hypercars, whatever you want to call them. But actually, um, I keep saying to the team, the really cool thing about this is there's nobody on the planet doing what we're doing. And there's nobody on the planet doing even something remotely close to what we're doing. Everybody else has different agendas. It's, it's sometimes it's a horsepower figure, it's a lap time, it's a top speed. Um, when I launched the F1 at McLaren, uh, I never once mentioned uh, any acceleration figures or top speed ahead of the launch. In fact, it took me four years to actually measure the top speed. That's how disinterested I was. I always knew it was going to be blindingly quick because of the weight and the power. Yeah. And it's the same with this. The, the, the only two targets I have for this car is the best engineered car on the planet and the best driving experience bar none that you'll ever be able to have now and probably forever the way we're going with cars getting heavier and bigger. That I don't care what the 0 to 100 is. We know once again it's going to be a fast car. If you look at the facts, you know, this has got a better power to weight ratio than a LaFerrari, a 918 Porsche, a McLaren P1 and even a McLaren P1 GTR. Right. So if anybody thinks this is going to be slow, <laughs> they got it wrong. <laughs> okay, so this might be the wrong question then, so, but have you been tempted to calculate a theoretical top speed? Yes, we have to. Right. We have to because um, you've got to pick a six gear. You have a final drive ratio. Well, with a transverse box, you have a bevel reduction. Then you have final drive in six gear and they multiply to give you the right gear at, for top speed. Yeah. So we've had to calculate it. And from memory, it's around 227, I think. This makes okay. a lot more downforce than the F1. So therefore, it's more draggy. And most people will think that the fan does work off the engine, like the old Bradley, yeah. but this is, it's a completely separate function. Yes, yeah, that, once again, that was very crude, and I was forced to do that by the F1 regs. It would have been illegal to have another motor in the car of yeah. any description. Um, this one is electrically driven, and to keep the weight down, it's a 48 volt motor, so it's much lighter than a 12 volt motor would, motor would have been. And on the front of the engine, we have an integrated starter generator, which makes the 48 volts for us. And you've just told me about this windscreen wiper. It looks amazing. There is a reason why it's designed the way it is. Yes, that's, but believe it or not, that's taken months to get right. Um, the F1 had a standard sort of looking square windscreen wiper and, and over I think 150, 160 miles an hour it started lifting off, yeah. off the windscreen. And uh, so I had to add at the last minute, I had to add an aerofoil to, this, to the wiper and it looks really messy. You know, Every time I see the car, I cringe a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this time we decided this is all machined from solid aluminium and it's actually the two blades make an airfoil section. So the wiper arm itself is a wing. Okay, so you, you've created downforce on your windscreen wiper. Yes. <laughs> Does that in any way contribute towards the car or is it far too well, small? Well, it'll be a it? tiny, with that surface area, <laughs> yes is the answer, but it'll be, you know, half a kilo or something probably. Okay, so you've got plenty of months of development still left on the car. What is to be wrapped up between now and when the car is delivered? Well, we're just, we're on the verge of running cars. So we, we have the first uh, V12 delivered from Cosworth tomorrow. Yep. By the end of next month, we've got George, which is our mule car running. Um, yeah, the F1 was uh, Edward and Albert, and this one's George. Any reason for the names? Uh, they're, they're British kings, English kings. Okay. Yeah. When enough. we did the SLR, we had German kings. We had three, we had Max, Otto and Rudolf. <laughs> <laughs> which were all TBRs. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so, sorry. So, we, we're the George is running by the end of next month, so we get to feel the right, the first gearbox and engine. Okay. Uh, it's in a kit car, basically. Uh, and then we start putting XP1 and XP2 prototypes together in September, and they run in October. And then we're solid 
We've got 13 prototypes we have to build with, these days with emissions and crash testing. With the F1, I only built five. Um, so we have 13 and between, they all get built from September till about March. And then those do massive amount of, you know, hot weather, cold weather, durability, corrosion, crash, all that sort of emissions, you know, all the homologation stuff you have to do. We, we don't skimp on testing, we do OEM style testing. So we do all the car dur durability cycles just to make sure the thing's gonna be reliable. Well, Gordon, thank you so much for having us. This is a spectacular machine and I cannot wait to see it moving. Thank you very much. I can promise you one thing, this will be the best driving experience you'll get anywhere. Cool, thank you. Pleasure. It's been such a privilege to come down today for the reveal of this new hypercar and what an honour to have Gordon Murray take us round it and tell us the story of it. I keep wanting to refer to him as Sir Gordon. I feel like he should have a knighthood. And to be honest, considering how good this car looks and the amount of tech within it, Queen Elizabeth, you know what to do.